my name is Nari Sol. I'm a pianist composer and throughout the past few years I've been sharing bits and pieces of my musical journey here on this channel while exploring different elements of music making. In this video, I want to share with you all the process that I'm currently going through while writing a piece for piano and orchestra, specifically for the Manitoba Chamber Orchestra. The piece is actually due in March for a performance in June, so given that it's currently November, I have quite a bit of time to work on this. So what I'll be sharing with you all today is a look at the very early and raw stages of this whole process. It was truly terrible. Total freedom quickly sounds simply like chaos. Do you play a piano with your pinky and whatever that then huh? fingernails? Now this will be a very long video with different pockets of discussion, so you may want to refer to the list of timestamps to skip to various sections depending on your interests. At the start of the project, I was given a unique opportunity to get in touch with individual members of the orchestra to ask them questions and get their feedback on various things. I'm Desiree Avi and I play cello. My name is Theo Chan. I play the double bass. My name is Victoria Sparks. I am a percussionist. Boyd McKenzie. Violin. Wait, can you say my name is? <laughs> my name is Boyd McKenzie. Don't do that again. <laughs> it's slightly nerve wracking and uncomfortable to share such a a new piece in this way. In order to communicate with them in an efficient manner, what I decided to do was to learn how to program this music using high quality virtual instruments rather than just handing them a PDF of the score or a lame basic MIDI track. I started out by writing out my ideas on manuscript paper at the piano while imagining different instruments for different parts. Then I transferred this over to a Sibelius file where I paid a little more attention to the difference of instruments and refined my ideas. Then I sort of dove into MIDI orchestration 101. Can you help me out with this? Yes. <laughs> Given that I've never done something quite like this before, I asked my good friend Julius, who is a fantastic composer with a ton of experience with MIDI orchestration, if he can help me out. What should I do first? Two options. You either export the MIDI from Sibelius to your DAW to, I think you use Logic, right? Or you play each line in one by one using your keyboard, your uh, mod wheel, and maybe an expression fader. Everybody has their own preference of doing things. I like to import the MIDI actually. Since you are a great keyboard player, I'd suggest playing each line in. I'd say it improves your workflow with samples in general. So taking his advice, I opened up a DAW, in this case, Logic Pro X, with a set of libraries from Native Instruments and basically went line by line playing in the parts. We'll ask Julius. My first pass at this was not the most successful. It was truly terrible. I had a terrible day. As you're smiling. As I'm smiling. You have such I... a great attitude. One of the first things he pointed out was that I wasn't minding the number of instruments I was using in the string sections, which in my case, I had the ability to adjust. You had violins one, 30 players. And then you took violins two A, 30 players, violins two B, also 30 players. Mm -hmm. This can't work, of course, but it depends on the sound profile that you're chasing. So for now, for violins one, we take the 16 players because this is more like an actual violins one sound. Then I learned the very basics of how to automate the modulation so that the phrases sound much more natural. Modulation, that's um, MIDI CC1, controls the actual samples that your sample library provides you with. So just based on my surface level understanding, there's this thing called modulation, which controls the different samples being used. So it's not just moving the volume toggle like this and making it sound softer or louder. It's actually pulling in samples where the violin in this case is actually playing softer and it's recorded playing softer. So there's a difference there. So with this line just played in, it sounds like this. Now this is with some help from Julius. In terms of getting legato, especially for the strings, what do I need to do other than 
play it in a certain way. So depending on the instrument, good sample libraries do provide you with a legato patch. And in that case, load a legato patch and make sure that the nodes do overlap. Remember, it was a hot mess. Yes, it, it still is. Still, uh, <laughs> yeah. The part that you play to me is, is rather brittle, sudden, right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So you have to make sure that the entrance of a node displays the actual behavior of a real violent section, like how they would play the beginning of a note. Imagine it to be sun, mm -hmm. you know, how, how would you sing it? Where's the breath? Where do you breathe in? Where do you breathe out? You know, if you do media orchestration, right? You're not on, only a composer in that moment. If you want to do proper media orchestration, you're mm -hmm. also a conductor. And a sound engineer. Oh yeah, 100% as a sound engineer. Uh, unless you're very successful and you have people doing that for you. So yeah. but. <laughs> before showing it to the musicians, Julius gave me a boost by quickly touching up a few details for me listed here on the screen. And he promised me that he'd help me learn a lot more about MIDI orchestration for an upcoming project. So I'm really looking forward to that. Let me share with you now the first part of the track that I presented to the musicians. the feel of the piece. Thank really, you. It really does sound way better than a, a MIDI. Yeah, it gives you a very clear idea. Each movement is from a different focal length. The beginning is kind of like from very afar. You see the broad, broad picture. Maybe if, if you're in a forest, you see the aerial view of everything and everything is very calm. You, you start to zoom in and maybe the improvisatory section is where you, you start to see all the individual leaves and the little, I don't know, creatures walking around. Each movement is, is a different perspective of, of that sort. In one of the movements, I want to include improvisation, definitely in the piano part, but also hopefully in the strings. And in order to communicate the type of texture and atmosphere that I want, I used a prepared piano sample just to use as a placeholder to communicate the type of sound that I'm going for. Then I asked the players what they think might be manageable for their individual parts. Would it be absurd to write in into the score, uh, do whatever you feel like, or is that giving oh, too much freedom? We get that all the time, don't we, Theo? Yeah. That might be good, you know? Generally speaking, the orchestra would need a specific instruction of sorts that they can like do, and then within that, they can have freedom. Often we've gotten pieces where it'll be uh, improvised with this uh, scale, improvise with these three notes. It depends on the overall effect that you want. Total freedom quickly sounds simply like chaos. You know how big our orchestra is, so you could even divide it by individual player if you wanted. Okay. Um, and then each of us would have our own ind distinct sound and you could say like, okay, stand one is gonna start here and do it this long. And then the, like you could sort of figure out how, how you want that sound to build or not or cut out. There's a performance aspect to it. I've always felt that when you just go to the orchestra and say, okay, you can do what you like here. Mm -hmm. They never feel completely confident in that. It might work, but it might not. 
if they have guidance, the sort of thing that Theo's talking about, sort of parameters, I think you get a more convincing performance. Now here's the next section that I had them listen to. Oh, thank you so much. So I'm pretty impressed with these synthesized sounds. Based on the score and the track, it's, it's easy to imagine how, how it might sound. Everything there is very, very pleasant. As you may have picked up, I'm a fan of the pizzicato sound in the strings. Ever since listening to Ravel's string quartet back when I was a teenager, I just fell in love with the sound. And I try to use it whenever possible when I'm working with string players. And speaking with these musicians helped me understand this technique a lot better. You just don't want them doing pizzicato for a half hour. <laughs> well, the bass always has a very resonant pizzicato, doesn't it, Theo? It does, yeah. It's not always the loudest, but it's quite resonant page 11, page 12, you know, there's a lot of doubling or tripling in the bass line with the, the cello, the double bass and the piano at the same time. You know, I mean, you'll get a very strong bass line that way, but it might be counterproductive to what, what you want. You might do it only in the cello and bass or only in the bass and piano. Yeah. That's very helpful. Well, in the piano in the string, the upper strings is always, uh, doesn't have anywhere near the resonance of the cello and the bass. It's short-lived. One of our colleagues, remember Dick Bell? You know? Yeah, I remember him. He described pizzicato as, as sound as like ping pong balls hitting sheep. <laughs> <laughs> when you've got the, the pizzicato, the, the fiddles, like th this, this will work, but it does de depend on numbers as well, doesn't it? I can't tell you how many times I've seen a whole note pizzicato. Tie it on to the next, on to the next. Yeah, just like, <laughs> 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 yeah, and sometimes with, with right. the hairpin on it, too. <laughs> that would be like a left hand pits off. Um, you're pitzing with your left hand. So anytime you utilize an open string, we can easily do a faster pit because we can just pits off. We can hammer off. We will hammer the note instead if you're going up. So that would be a hammer versus... Oh. Okay. How do you indicate that? Just hammer. You write <laughs> hammer. <laughs> this piece definitely has a clear piano part, but I also consider the marimba a solo instrument. So speaking with percussionist Victoria Sparks was extremely helpful. The marimba can kind of fill the job of, of a solo, of like, like a single line melody, and it also can fill the job of like a piano or a guitar. Some of the interesting things to do are to kind of build like kind of mixed setups around a keyboard instrument.
a symbol and two wood blocks and a pair of bongos and a shaker and a something and you just kind of have some trays and things set up around uh -huh. the instrument we tend to love contraptions you can put things beside you you can put stuff on the floor and use your feet i've got shells and bamboo and glass and ceramic and <laughs> I also asked her how specific the notation should be. I think maybe the articulation is the more important part. If you if you if you want it to be very brittle and articulate, say that, and I'll choose something that I that works in that space and that for those instruments. More than asking for a specific stick, asking for a specific sound or sound concept, I think will get you more from a player. Another thing that I asked was about the maximum interval that a marimba player can play comfortably while using two mallets in each hand. In the left hand maybe an eighth or like a ninth with my hands like okay. maybe it maybe a tenth if i was feeling crazy but like that's yeah. a big stretch um and then and then maybe a little bit more and like maybe, maybe the tenth would be pretty more comfortable okay. somebody told me once that if you play the piano with your pinky and pointer <laughs> that's pretty similar to how a marimba could function like and you can have overlap uh -huh. them and you can cross them and okay. you can do whatever but like interval wise kind of what you can stretch okay. like that if you play a piano with your pinky and whatever that, that, uh -huh. that that's similar to how it would at least work itself out as chart in terms of logistics on a marimba it was also so helpful when desiree pulled out her cello to give me more insight into extended techniques you can get different sounds with the like you do like a rhythm um, you could get like a, a more sonic thing or you could ask for like more like finger, finger, fingernails, uh, and you could do close to the bridge, caleno, a caleno okay. ricochet, and, you, and then you could indicate pitched glissandi or going up or down or just, or anything as you will. Is there a standard way of notating this type of material or does everyone treat it differently? Um, everyone treats it a little differently. Depends how, like some composers are super specific and sometimes it gets almost lost in translation because it's overly specific. Th then you just describe it. So like place your palm on the back and then slide up in a rhythmic fashion. Just give them a brief description. Well, I'm looking forward to seeing what happens in the section that uh, has an improvisational placeholder right now. I think that'll be interesting. I very much like the feel, the, uh, yeah, the feel of the piece, the groove of it. It's really good, really good. I think what you've done is, is really, really brilliant. And I think it's really good. And I, I look forward to seeing what else you, you know, you do with it. I think the three parts will go together very well. Looking forward to it. Thank you so much. Hope to connect again soon. Bye. Stay safe. Bye. I really want to thank the Manitoba Chamber Orchestra for making this project possible, especially to the musicians that took the time to speak with me. By the way, they have a budding YouTube channel that I'll link below in the description for all of you to check out. Also, a huge thank you to Julius for helping me so much with the MIDI orchestration, to Native Instruments for allowing us to use their libraries, and to my patrons on Patreon for helping me spend time working on videos like this. Thank you so much again for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.